Ladies and gentlemen, this is an open invitation to follow pain in your own body. And we will do this by starting a movie. So you will all experience that this really hurts, and it is amazing how in milliseconds the pain is transferred through specific nerve fibers to the central nervous system. And that's important because pain is good. And if this not is a fast process, we will have continuous pain. So pain is a good warning sign, but it also protects us from continuous pain. And here you are in the central nervous system, and you see it goes on and on. And when it comes to the next nerve ending, these small vesicles, which you see now here, will be activated and are able to <coughs> motivate the next nerve fiber to fire into the direction of the central nervous system. And throughout the years, people have known what are the specific projections of these painful stimuli in the central nervous system, as indicated here. And one of the major challenges is now, how can we understand what's going on with this kind of phenomena at different age groups? So if you feel, according to the definition of the International Association for the Study of Pain, pain is related to tissue damage. But if you go back home, you talk about pain because pain is everywhere. It's a daily sequence in many lives. Many people suffer from chronic pain. And we like to talk about pain when we are at birthday parties, just like politics and soccer. So as a matter of fact, that's why this organization choose self-report as the gold standard. And when you're over three years of age, that's very logical because you can express your pain. But what about these? I would call this the self-report paradox. Because is this all pain or is it just that the mother has left the child? That's not pain, it can be emotional pain. But you, it's very hard to make an appropriate interpretation of that. So <coughs> we put our focus on the number of children less than three years of age, because if you look at the uh, upper picture of a premature born infant, in the middle of a critically ill infant and at the lower part of a cognitive impaired child, you would really wonder how do they express their pain and maybe we neglect their pain as well as that we wonder whether pain relief is really adequate. We went through in our search for the optimal solutions and surprisingly, in the medical community, and it's really a shame that I have to tell you this, that it was considered up till 1980 that preterms and fish do not feel pain. Did it improve over the years? Unfortunately not. Even in our institution, there is an average of 14 painful events a day when you are in a neonatal ICU. While we don't know much about the long-term effects, neither of the pain itself will it be the prerequisite of uh, prolonged and chronic pain, as well as the potential negative effects of painkillers. We have learned over the years <coughs> that close observation of behavior is the way to go. This is key to our understanding of pain in those who are not able to express this in a reliable way. And this is just the cover of an instruction CD-ROM that Monique van Dijk, my senior co-investigator, distributed all over the world as the gold standard of pain assessment in this particular age group. When you are cognitive impaired, it might be even more difficult to understand because there is not one diagnosis, not one disease which leads to intellectual disability. The other more important issue might even be what is normal behavior? And you have to have the caretakers of the parents in close collaboration with us to understand what is normal and what is pain in this particular case. And by the way, self-report in this kind of people <coughs> is not reliable at any age if you think about an adult with a progressive neurodegenerative disease. And again, the solution was that we observe behavior in a more or less a laboratory environment and this is the instruction CD-ROM which went on. Obviously, there are many painkillers and there are one million prescriptions of painkillers a year in the Netherlands. But before we ever think about giving 
any painkiller. It's obvious that non-pharmacological approaches, as beautifully demonstrated in this uh, painting of Klimt, is the primary approach in every age. But even if you are very critically ill, like this child in our ICU, this is where you see massage by the parents and the caretakers as an integral part of our way to do the best for the child. We know for many, many centuries that when you evaluate here this poppy field, it's known as the source of opioids and morphine. And thanks to the World Health Organization, we have come to a generally accepted way how we deal with pain when you have to give a pharmacological uh, approach in this respect by the so-called analgesic ladder, but also by the clock, which means that you don't need to prove every time again, which is a common mistake, that only you get analgesia when you prove that you have pain. And I think this is a totally wrong concept nowadays. Obviously, by an appropriate route, and if possible, together with the patient. What's new in this area? And what's new is that we try to come to individualized care. And if you have headache at the end of the day, you know that for you, it will help to have four paracetamol every six hours. While your neighbor might be having his pain relieved by one in 12 hours. And this is totally determined by your genetic makeup. And so we are at the edge of individualized uh, drug therapy, not only for pain, but also for cancer. More importantly, and this is a uh, project by Bram Falkenburg, one of our uh, PhD students, is that we really want to sort out whether there is a difference in pain sensitivity. And instead of having the children to the hospital, we will go into the country with this so-called MADEBUS. It will be officially released in two weeks, and this is a part of a very uh, challenging project because it will be the first time that we take care of individual pain sensitivity in this particular group of children with Down syndrome. Moreover, if you think back of the movie where I started with, you will see that we now be able to visualize the differences in <coughs> uh, uh, the differences in areas of the brain over time, which might have a tremendous input and effect on the way we can recognize pain, but also to individualize the response and to understand why my pain is not the same as your pain. So if we take all we have known from children, even from the fetus, as you see here in the newborn, we wondered whether it would be relevant for other groups of people. And the answer is yes. The answer is yes for elderly people. And you might ask yourself, why do you care? Because she looks so happy. I cannot imagine that she, imagine that she has pain. But the real truth is that there is an epidemic of pain coming over us. But because if you look at an emerging problem of an aging population, we will have 4 million people over 65 years of age. And the prevalence of chronic pain in the absence of the right choices of drugs is 40 to 80 percent. We also know that they continuously underreport their pain. So there is really a big issue coming up in front of us. And this is, <clears throat> and I'm really proud on that, this is the first pain assessment scale based on this beautiful picture of Picasso, which we called the Repos, the Rotterdam Elderly Pain Observation Scale, which has just recently been approved as the main performance indicator by the Dutch Inspect Inspectorate of Health to evaluate pain in those elderly people who do have the inability to express their pain in a way that we can understand. So, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, if we think about pain, it started all with the biology of pain. It's a response or a prevention of tissue damage. But pain is much more. Pain is also psychology, it's a social event, and it is culture. In other words, I think that we can say that pain is really a life experience, which is there from the beginning to the end. We all suffer from it from time to time, 
and just in a way to uh, put it in a uh, totally different aspect, I would say that your pain is my pain. And what I mean by that, that together with my research group and as a clinician scientist, I'm pretty frustrated that I have not solved that problem. But I will leave you with the promise that we will move on to solve this universal problem. Thank you. Dick Tibble, thank you very much. What if you never have pain? You're missing something? Uh, <laughs> Does it make you a stronger person to feel pain now and then? Now, there, there are two conditions in which you have a problem with pain. One is lepra, and everybody knows how lepra patients look like. So yes. if you cannot sense pain, right. it has a tremendous effect. But I don't think that... Uh, we should all have a life without any pain. I feel that it has some evolutionary meaning as well. Okay, thank you very much. Dictable.